Two questions haunt every life, writes Andy Crouch. The first, what are we meant to be? And the second, why are we so far from what we're meant to be? Hello and welcome to Restoring the Soul, a podcast dedicated to helping you close the gap from what you're meant to be and what keeps you from being all that. I'm your producer, Brian Beatty. Thank you for listening to Restoring the Soul. You know, there's power in prayer. I believe it. I've seen the results in my own life and in others. And prayer is one of the best ways, indeed, not the only way, to connect with God. But do you know that there are many unique and personal methods of prayer? Centering and contemplative prayer are a few of them. That's what Michael John Cusick will be discussing today with our guests, Brad Jursak and Peter Zaremba. Now, at its core, centering prayer allows you to rest deeply in God, in silence, and to let go of the thoughts, emotions, memories, images, or even sensations that will inevitably come into awareness during prayer. Based on Paul's letter to the Ephesians, centering prayer can be tied directly to chapter 4, verses 22 to 24, where Paul says, "'Put off your old self.'" which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, centering prayer may be a new concept to you, or it may be something that you already practice in your everyday life. It's our hope that over the next hour, you're drawn in and encouraged by this conversation. So without any further delay, here's your host, Michael John Cusick. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Restoring the Soul. I'm Michael, and we are on the fourth floor of the Academy Center in Lakewood, Colorado, overlooking Eeny Meeny Sushi, Old Chicago Pizza, and Denny's Restaurant. Hey, um, today I'm going to start with a joke, or at least a partial joke. What happens when a Catholic businessman, a Protestant pastoral counselor, and an Orthodox theologian walk into a podcast studio? You're probably scratching your head. You will find out now, because I'm sitting in the Restoring the Soul studio with Brad Jersek, who is a theologian, author, and pastor, and minister at large, and friend of mine. And a very special guest today in the studio is my longtime, 35 years, I think, friend, Peter Zaremba, who has come in from the New York City area. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here. And welcome, Reverend Dr. Jersak. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's it's. We're, I can't believe that we're face to face. We are uh, today heading down a day ahead of time. Uh, we will be together with uh, about 30 men who are participating in our Surfing for God weekend intensive, and about 25 staff are flying in today. So we have the uh, the joy of being together before we head down there to Colorado Springs. Hey, the topic today and over the next couple of episodes is going to be on centering prayer. And um, I had a guest in the past on to talk more about just her whole approach to life and spirituality, and we touched on centering prayer. But for a while now, I have wanted to uh, to actually dedicate a couple episodes to this idea of contemplation, stillness, restfulness. And so in this first episode, we're going to kind of address the question, what is contemplation and how does centering prayer fit into that? In the second episode, we're going to talk about what are the benefits? Why do it? How can it impact you? How can it change your life like it has in certain ways for each of us? And then finally, we'll talk about how to do it. And there's not just one way of doing centering prayer or contemplative prayer. But let's start, and you guys can just randomly jump in. And if you don't, then there will just be a long period of silence. But um, talk about each of you and your experience with centering prayer, how that happened, and just a little bit of your journey. Eeny, meeny, miny, Brad, is it Peter or is it Brad? Yeah, it looks like it's going to be Peter. All right, uh, Peter. Yeah, um, a great intro. So uh, 
uh, about four years ago, I was uh, had the opportunity to uh, attend uh, the Living School, which uh, was Richard Rohr's uh, uh, Center for Action and Contemplations. Uh, it's kind of like a underground seminary, if you will. And the teachers were uh, Richard Rohr, Cynthia Bourgeault, who's written a book on Centering Prayer. Two books was, on Centering Prayer. Yeah, correct. And was a disciple of Thomas Keating, who we recently lost. Um, and uh, James Finley, who was... Uh, uh, you know, a disciple of uh, Thomas, Thomas Merton. Merton. And so um, it was all about uh, developing a, uh, a contemplative practice and uh, the idea of uh, this unit of consciousness, which was, for me, very new. Um, and so it's, it's a practice-driven uh, experience. And um, that's when I embraced Centering Prayer. And the easiest way I can say it, or the way I would put it in my own words, is it is uh, a choice to enter silence uh, where you just end the self-talk for 20 minutes every day and where your normal patterns, my normal patterns of compulsive uh, thinking and compulsive emotion and even, you know, body sensation where you, you take a time out from that and where it both exposes uh, the strength of those patterns. Richard Rohr uh, calls it 20 minutes of failure, which I always thought was a great, I love that. a great way to look at it. It is a practice that enables you to strengthen and develop an inner mechanism where you detach from your normal mode of doing the moment, if you will. So I want to come back to a couple of issues. Detachment, that's an important word, often misunderstood in my experience, as well as unitive consciousness. People might have just tuned out saying, you know, this sounds like a physics uh, lecture from Princeton University. But I know what you mean by that, and I think it's an important concept to unpack. Brad, tell me about your journey and experience. Um, I grew up in a, in a Baptist tradition that had no sense of contemplation. And then, well, we would have described that as Bible, reading your Bible and praying every day, I suppose, was meditation for us. And then and then had a charismatic experience, and elements of that fe felt very frenetic to me. So I wanted something more grounded, and that's when I discovered the Spanish mystics and especially fell in love with Teresa of Avila. And what what she did for me was, was lead me into um, uh, recollection, and she described that as, as calling all the bees of your thoughts, your memories, your issues, your worries, calling the bees back to the hive and entering quietness with that and then focusing on just one image. I, I began to practice that almost like I, I have to, in the ways that charismatics introduced me to the Holy Spirit, I, I needed that not to be so much a brush fire as, as kind of the still, the gentle uh, whisper. That's been part of my journey, too. And I think one of the things you and I have in common, uh, other than the fact that we each have the letter K in one of our names, uh, is the fact that there is this mixture of uh, conservative upbringing and evangelicalism, a charismatic immersion, and you very much, and I can too, operate in, quote, the gifts of the Spirit and yet contemplation and that's a that's a very rare mixture so i'm i'm really glad to be talking to you and peter on the other hand is just a weird outright mystic which is why he uses <laughs> phrases like unitive consciousness and and things like that i'm just kidding um peter you, you you are somebody that by the way we uh we worked together in young life back in the 80s mm -hmm. and i need to say this for people that are familiar with my book surfing for god um you are the Peter in the book who I tell the story in one of the latter chapters of the book where um, I met Saranac Village in upstate New York. We were at a leadership conference and I had this intense desire to want to do something great for God. And you and I, uh, ironically, couldn't sit for the 20 minutes in silence. We were too restless. So afterwards we were like, yeah, that, that was a waste of time. And we went down to the dock and we knelt down. And I remember praying words like, God, you know, I just want to be used for your kingdom. And I just, I just want to, you know, I want to glorify you and do anything. We surrender our lives to you. And it was absolutely positively sincere for where we're at at that moment. And then I tell the story in the book, fast forward you know, 25 years where I'm curled up in a ball in a closet mm -hmm with post-traumatic stress disorder. And my friend walked in and he was sitting there in this place where I was very humiliated. 
and God spoke into my mind, Michael, I'm answering your prayer Hmm. from that doc when you said you wanted great things for my kingdom. Hmm. And so that story is actually very much related to this. Great things for God are not triumphal, heroic, muscle flexing for Jesus, but great things for God are really the capacity to be still and from that place to overflow. Um, So I want to touch on this idea of recollection from Teresa of Avila or Avila or Avila. Uh, But it's interesting when, Brad, you refer to Teresa of Avila, 15th century, right? Probably best known for interior castle. You can fast forward from the 15th century up to uh, evangelicals like A.W. Tozer, you know, who is one of the the poster children for uh, being an evangelical thinker. Um, Knowledge of the Holy, his book, that he was someone who practiced this presence of the indwelling presence of God. So everything we're talking about is both really rooted in church history and practice, also going back to the Desert Fathers and Mothers, and then as recent as Cynthia Bergeol, uh, a theologian and Episcopal priest, and Thomas Keating, as you mentioned, who is probably best known for the modern uh, practice and teaching on centering prayer. So there really is a larger context to this, that it's not just a new faddish thing. And please hear, listener, that as we're talking about this, everything that we speak of and the language that we use is all about this Psalm 4610 idea of be still and know that I'm God. And I've said this so many times, and I, I think a number of times on this podcast, but that The hardest command in the Bible for me to obey is not per se to love God with all my heart or to avoid sexual immorality or don't lie or steal. The hardest command for me is to be still and know that he is God. So that's what we're going to unpack with no further ado. Brad, the very first time you heard about centering prayer or that you encountered Teresa of Avila, what did that look like on the very first time when you tried to be still or center yourself? Well, uh, failure. We covered that one, right? Um, say, say more what you mean by that, though, because it, it's it's really not a pass-fail, but there's what we, you guys mean by that is that you are, from the moment you start, it's not going to work. Right. So the whole idea of, of holding attention on one, let's say, one image or one word um, even just before the episode, we spent five minutes, and I'm, I'm like, I had to call the bees back twice. And um, I no longer live in condemnation about that, but I would say initially there was frustration about that. It's like, my goodness, I can't even stay focused for for five minutes. What what's going on with this? And and it was an exposure of of a scrambled mind and. Um, But I also want to say, like, for me, it was highly visual. And so there is a kind of stillness you get to where it's maybe meant to be silent and imageless. But for me, um, you know, in in my utmost for his highest, who's that? Oswald Chambers. Lee Harvey Oswald. (laughs) Yeah. Um, He he talks about God gave you your imagination, and the highest function of that imagination is to gaze on the throne of Christ. And so um, I, I use that a lot. I use the the image of Christ on the throne um, as as my centering image, and now I've shifted to see that the, the throne was the, was the cross. That's the throne, the, the, and so I I use I use the visual in that sense, and that helps me a lot. Right, and so as you read different books about centering prayer. Uh, this idea of being still, finding your center, that there will be people who say, oh, you can't have a visual representation or you can't have a mantra. Uh, We'll talk about the sacred word or prayer word in a minute. But I want to just say that you do whatever works, and there is a specific four-point guideline to centering prayer, as Thomas, Thomas Keating talks about it. But it really is about just being still and doing whatever allows you to get to that place. Let me just throw in a, a verse from Psalm 27, 4 on top of your Oswald Chambers quote. Uh, David said, there's one thing I ask of the Lord. This is what I seek, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple and to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
And that's a fascinating verse because first he says toward the end of his life, there's one thing I want. And then what's the temple and the house of the Lord today? It's you and it's you and it's me. Mm. And so he's saying, if I could paraphrase it, um, one thing I ask of the Lord to gaze upon his beauty within me. And this is this indwelling presence again. And so this conversation is not about looking at God up there or out there, but contemplation and ultimately centering prayer as a practice allows us to experience God within. And very interestingly, I'll come back to you and hear, Peter, what you meant by failure, but that you experience God by virtue of not being able to do it well. Hmm. Uh, Another way of saying that it's about failure. I like to say that centering prayer is a practice of doing nothing in the presence of God and doing nothing poorly. That requires me to trust that I'm loved (laughs) and that God's not up in heaven with his glasses on the end of his nose saying, can't you do this right, Cusick? Can't you do this right, Peter? I mean, really? 20 minutes? You can't just focus and be with me? So I'm rambling, but what do you think it means that it's about failure. Yeah. Um, you know, Cynthia Bergeault stresses uh, centering prayer is a practice of intention more than attention, meaning the intention is to consent to the presence and action of God and uh, it objectless attention. So uh, for, you know, for, a, for adult ADHD, uh, a friend of yours here that uh, sits, so I would, I would sit in my first sits, I would you know, have my sacred word, I would, I would begin and immediately find myself, you know, uh, with a grocery list in my head walking, you know, a whole food aisle, or obsessing over an email, you know, who will pitch for the Mets tonight, just this constant stream of anything but objectless attention. The key for me was to compassionately try to return to that place for to have self compassion on my inability uh, to be there. So, you know, the, 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 the classic story is Keating gives a, a retreat early on and a nun comes up to him after her first attempt at centering prayer and says, you know, uh, you know, Father Thomas, you know, I'm the world's worst. I had, you know, I had 10,000 distractions and Keating without blinking an eye says, how beautiful, 10,000 opportunities to return to God. And so I think, yeah, once, once I kind of realized, uh, I would never, uh, hear the ending gong and, you know, uh, congratulate myself that I'd nailed it. But the idea was to, to participate in that return to, um, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to that place of, of, of centering is, is, is the practice. If you think of the prodigal son story where the son leaves and then comes back and there's this great celebration in a 20 minute time of centering prayer, we can live out the prodigal son story, you know, hundreds of times. Martin Laird, who wrote a book called Into the Silent Land and a second and third book, part of his trilogy, um, he is a, a priest who teaches at Villanova, and he uses this, uh, this phrase, and this is prop- probably popular in other circles as well, but he talks about the cocktail party in our head or the videos that play in our mind that people often think, well, if I was really spiritual or if I was doing this right, that would go away. But you're saying that it's about this um, compassion and acceptance, Mm -hmm. that that's part of our humanity, and by virtue of being compassionate about that distraction or leaving, it actually allows us to come back. It does. I I think, too, and to go back to the idea of a unit of consciousness, which which sounds very uh, complicated. It's not. John fifteen five says, you know, I am the vine and you are the branches. You know, Jesus is proclaiming this, this reality that exists. The problem is, is that I'm rarely in touch with, it. I'm rarely awakened to it. And so in centering prayer, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to somehow access, uh, and awaken to that reality that, that always, that is always in existence, that, that, that I'm not separated from God. Or from anyone else or anything else, but 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 it's so rare that I'm in in touch with that. Um, Good stuff from John fifteen, um, Brad. I was remembering the importance of thinking on God gazing on us, not our ability to have a undistracted gaze on God. And one thing that really helped me with mm. self compassion in this was 
um, an image I got probably from John White of a of a dad taking his toddler child for a walk around a pond. And they're on this walk, and then the child totally uh, gets his distracted to looking on some ducks at the pond and forgets about his dad altogether. And rather than despising the kid or, or, or looking down on the kid or scolding the kid, um, the father just gazes on the kid as, as he's hmm. enraptured by these ducks until he's ready to carry on with the walk. And, and so such uh, even adoration in the, in the dad's gaze and to know that as I have this intention uh, to walk with him, I'm going to see stuff along the way. And like, maybe that's not even bad. And maybe even ducks are the issue for that day. And it's like, I just want to gaze on you as you look at your ducks. And this is, this counts somehow. So I, I stopped beating myself up about it quite a while ago. And that was surely helpful. And this sounds so cliche, but uh, this is, this is an opportunity, whether it's one minute of stillness and silence or a 20-minute, you know, formal centering prayer practice, it's really an opportunity to trust and believe the gospel that God just wants our heart, that he just wants us, that he's glad that we came, that we showed up, and that he has joy as he looks upon us in the same way that a father going to the park with his kid would have. And there's just something so ingrained in us and in me still after uh, exploring this for over 20 years and, and practicing more consistently for the last couple of years uh, that really can react and believe that God somehow wants me to perform well during this 20 minutes. Talk about how you guys have experienced that. Yeah, I um I, I agree with that. I think I think it's uh, a deep trust that you know, as Merton would say, the desire to please you pleases you. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I think centering prayer, if you stay with the practice, has uh you know, has this great ability to kind of dismantle all so many of the you know, foundational uh lies that I've always thought about God, uh, what it takes to please him, uh, and, and that it's about performance, uh, and, and that it's about my um, worthiness or my performance or, uh, and, and just to be in a mode of receiving. Um, and and that, that just takes, if you've, if you've spent decades reinforcing that, you know, it, it takes a while to develop a practice that begins to impact your own life but I, I you know I've, I've, I've just seen um, I've seen the impact it's had over time subtly um, and it's hard to describe sometimes it's a little hard to put words to so I'm going to ask you to try to put words to it because um, you and I were both uh, leaders in young life mm -hmm. you went on staff with them for a number of years that's a ministry that is uh, driven and exhausting and requires uh, youth to be able to succeed at. And uh, you and I were certainly not contemplative or still during that season. Um, you then went on, did some graduate work in pastoral counseling and psychology. Uh, you were on staff at another church. Um, and you're not the same person that you were then. And part of that is because life beats the hell out of us. But this practice has taken you to a very different experience of your faith and how you do life. That's true. And, and for the last 20 years, I've sold industrial controls, which, you know, getting a master's in counseling and working for a church is a great preparation for. So you are the Catholic businessman. I am. Uh, from the uh, joke but, at the beginning. Yeah, I'll say this. You know, um, years ago, I was at a trade show and a, and a, and a colleague came up to me. We were very close um, about 10 years prior and had done a lot of business together. And um, he came up, he, sa he said, you know, what, what's happened to you? And, uh, you know, we were talking and, and uh, you know, his comment to me was, we all loved you, but we were scared to death of you. You were, you were the most angry, controlling guy we'd ever met. Um, and, you know, I could, I heard that. I wasn't devastated. Driving home, I, I, I was really uh, moved because I would have never described myself that way. Um, and, and, and it's not that I never 
uh, am, am tempted to try and take control of something I can't, or it's not that I never experience anger as an emotion. What I do know is that a contemplative practice is the only thing, really, the, the only place where you begin to um, learn how to step outside yourself, observe your place, not having an emotion, but an emotion having you, and then begin to let go of that in a substantial way, um, which as you begin to develop that, you, you actually get much better at your tasks. You get better at your job because there's not this, you, you're, you, you are not being possessed, <laughs> you know, by your, by the way I've always done it. I'm not, I'm not controlled by the outcome, right? I don't have to, I, I can't take control of something that, uh, in steering this, engineering everything to this desired outcome. You're letting go of that. You're letting go of this, this need to, uh, you know, this illusion that I can perfectly steer this the way it has to go. So, um, yeah, you, uh, 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 Cynthia Brichol references this, uh, uh, Philippians 2, of where it says that, um, uh, it talks about um, uh, Jesus, you know, the self-emptying of Jesus, um, the idea of kenosis. And she would she used the term that he was a practitioner of radical non-clinging. So, you know, what does it mean to be a radically non-clinging non sa sales professional? Non-clinging to what? Let's go back to Jesus. N non, just non-clinging to, uh, to my normal way of doing the moment to the outcome yes yeah to, so things have to be this way right things have to turn out this way right i can be in the present instead of what needs to happen in the next moment correct okay. which which Roy would then go on to say is is the absolute uh is is the relationship of the trinity this outpouring father to son son to holy spirit holy spirit to, just this this constant outpouring uh that that is gets at the very you know, those that's the action or the verb that takes that w where we somehow become a participant in that in life, where we are participating with flow, where uh, our, our life becomes something of being a conduit as opposed to uh, manufacturing, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. And <clears throat> as you use the word flow, sorry, everybody, I've I've got uh, three frogs in my throat today. Um, as you talk about flow, the, the, the words that I use to describe that is the energy of relationship, the energy of connection, and that out of that connection, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the three of us sitting here, uh, a marriage, that something grows, something's generated, that that kind of unity is always generative. Brad, jump in about uh, the Trinity, since you are our resident Trinity theologian, and, and um, how Centering Prayer relates to that. Well, you can see how, the, like, we use the language of detachment, and it's not about disconnecting mm -hmm. from from relationship. Um, it's it's the self emptying. Well, what's being emptied? Well, Christ was <laughs> um, self in self giving love, in other centered love. So so detachment is a, is more about the unclinging so that I can pour myself out in relationship as Father, Son, and Spirit do. So they've poured themselves out into this world as divine love. And, and it, so if we want to be like God, we can't be like Adam and Eve grasping at godness. If we want to be like God, we do the letting go, the kenosis and self-emptying love. And ironically, that is what that is godlike. That is divine. It's to it's to participate in the divine nature, which is self giving love. That clinging is something that even in the last twenty four hours, as I've been preparing my heart for uh, this intensive weekend we're going to do with men, um, I, I've been fantasizing about how the weekend has to turn out a certain way. That quote, it needs to be successful. That I need to come across a certain way. And for me, that's being that's clinging to and being attached to a certain outcome. But just with a stressful couple of weeks I've had, uh, I found myself clinging a lot to images of this new car that I made the mistake of stopping at an auto dealership because uh, I was getting an oil change. So I walked into the showroom and I got assaulted by the salesman and he gave me the, you know, the, the brochure and it's all colored. And I was just thinking through like spending so much time very randomly in my head 
clinging to, man, if I if I traded in my twenty year old Dodge Intrepid, and you know I could get that that via, that would be that would ah oh, that would just be amazing, and I, and I know that might sound superficial, but this idea of clinging and attachments are really what the spiritual fathers and mothers spoke of as addictions. What we call addictions today, they call attachments. Mm. And attachment is clinging, yes. And detachment is that kenotic, kenosis self-emptying that ironically, instead of holding on to the power or control, when we let go of that, we actually gain power in our weakness, in our emptiness, and we find our life because we've lost it. I'm saying all that just to kind of provide, again, a, a, a scriptural background and, and, and tying some of these esoteric ideas into just the teaching and the life and practice of Jesus. Where this jumps in, like back to sort of stuff we learned maybe from Merton, was also then this kind of detachment from the demands of the ego or the false selves. So I have, a, I have this script going on in my head and my relationship to the voice of the ego inside is usually uh, it's either self-importance, self-loathing, or or self-pity. Usually, that's the the unholy trinity of of Brad's ego, and and so for me, uh, centering prayer then detaches me from those demands. In fact, it insults them and hopefully bankrupts them. And I'd like it to crucify them, but I I feel like probably that's not the case. They're doing push-ups all the time. <laughs> Great words, because as a young believer struggling with pornography and masturbation, which I just loathed myself for, and then later for full-on sexual addiction, infidelity, alcoholism, I would say, I know I'm supposed to crucify this, um, but I never knew what that meant. I always thought it was like gritting my teeth, clenching my fists, digging in my heels, counting to three, and then saying, okay. It's dead. Which is self-will, which yes. got you in their trouble in the first place. And it totally undoes the, you know, the classic, certainly evangelical idea that it's not by works, but by grace, right? Um, yeah, and your point is, is that that kind of self-will actually fuels addiction because it will inevitably lead to pride or shame. Um, Brad, as you talked about crucifying the, the ultimate irony of this practice of centering prayer and being still is that it's by doing nothing with intention that we actually crucify the flesh rather let me say our our false self our sin nature um and those things that hold us captive yeah and 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 again it's it's such a counterintuitive uh practice because uh you know if you're not just if you're a three on the Enneagram, but if, if you if you tend to approach everything by it's about uh, technique results. If you spent your life, you know, we talk about young life, you know, I, I, young life, we used to have goals and, you know, read, uh, you know, Steve Covey's book on seven habits of highly effective people. And you get into this mindset where, you know, Dale Carnegie and you've got, you know, your unifying principles and all this. And it just, you know, it's there's a very easy way to spiritualize uh, this notion of uh, of, of self will and the ability to navigate life, so uh, it's the beauty of the practice for me is it's a chance to live life in a very different way, where you and I, I love the way you said it, Michael, by surrendering my normal control by a, assuming a position of humility and dependence. There's a very strange type of control that grows out of that that's healthy that fills you with great confidence in god's love that allows for mystery that allows for uncertainty that allows for the unknown uh i just know you know the way um the way i treat people at this stage in my life is just has much more grace to it and appreciation for their differences um because everything's bigger you know, again, not to be a, an advertisement for Roar, but you know, he he, you know, one of his uh, early, uh, earliest books, "Everything Belongs." Mm -hmm. You know, um, the world that I lived in for decades, very few things belonged, and, <laughs> and you know, or very, I, there were very few things that I wanted to belong. And that leads to hiddenness, oh, right? Well, of course, we're, we're we're isolated. We we can't experience intimacy with God or others. 
uh, and the shame that yeah. comes from that. Yeah. I remember, I remember in, a, in a brief intro for one of his books where I said uh, he talked about union with everything, which is union with God. And he said it. And I'm like, well, that's that's got to be heretical. Like, this is cr- like, what am I doing? Like, I need to run in the other direction. But I, because it was such a radical concept to me that that union with the divine union with others with everything with creation that you know that that's actually a possibility to grow into um to spend the rest of a lifetime being able to uh, um, experience can i clarify or ask a question about something you said that that union is something to grow into and you and i've had a lot of conversations around this that 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 union with god is not something that we have to acquire it's not something that we have to attain it's something that is the indwelling presence of God. God is everywhere. Christ is in us. And and so it's something that we practice being attentive to and that we can more reflexively live in. Would you would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I believe that our divine union is a re- is a reality that you awaken to. But but it's the inability to experience is on my side. Any time and that's again centering prayer being this practice of intention i i'm intent my intention is to consent to the presence and action of god so uh it's where it's on my side if i show up for that so we could pose a question to someone you know how close do you feel to god right now people might say well you know i i didn't have a quiet time this morning or i haven't gone to church and none of those answers are really definitive of how close God is, right? He is as near as our breath. The Spirit of God is the breath within us. We are his temple. He dwells within us. And so it really is about awareness or about attentiveness to his presence, which is always there and will never depart. There's this sweet spot between um, striving and despair <laughs> that— so there is, it's a tension without striving, but also releasement or surrender without just despairing and or like becoming utterly passive. So there, there is this cool Greek, uh, Greek, German word, galassenheit. And if you were to God really... God bless you. Galassenheit. Um, if you were to really give a literal translation of it, it would be releasement. Mm. And, and it's, you're gazing on the... This is from Heidegger. He... You're gazing on the horizon for what's coming, but all you can do is be open and receptive, open, attentive, receptivity. Uh, but I, I love the language I hear through through Peter here. It's 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 consent, it's letting go, it's surrender. All of that is saying no to my again my ego's demand to manage everybody mm-hmm. and to manage the world, which is all about control. And again, we you know we love 12 step recovery what's the third step it's like we become willing to surrender our lives and our will over to the care not the control of of god right and so we have this loving caring god who and 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 what is it to draw near him it's it's to surrender ourselves to his care i feel super passive when i do that in it like in a good way open-handed open-hearted I love this conversation. I didn't think we would get to quoting Heidegger or uh, multi-syllabic German words, but this is such good stuff. Hey, let's end here. Peter, will you talk about the sacred word or the prayer word, what that is, and then will you talk us through what you do, and we will do an episode more on what to do in Centering Prayer, but what it looks like for you if you do a 20-minute Centering Prayer sit yeah, I have a. Uh, I I take my phone and I have a timer on it, and when the timer goes, it hits twenty minutes. Not the Harley Davidson motorcycle. Uh, no ring no. when the timer goes ripples, off. Ripples, ripples, very. Uh, yes, very soothing, very soothing. Ri- ripples. But uh, I'll I will uh, hit my timer and I will. Uh, Jim Finley would always have us bow, which is just a position. Immediately creates this position of rev- reverence. Um, you know, your, your, your sitting posture is, is not critical, but it's important. You want to be comfortable. Uh, you want to have your back straight. You want to have your feet on the ground if you can. The centering, or excuse me, the, the uh, sacred word is a tool or a mechanism 
uh, that helps you it, it helps you enter that position of consent uh, to the uh, presence and action of God. And then when I again, when I and I will. Uh, it's it's inevitable uh, find myself making a grocery list, obsessing over a conversation I had at work, um, thinking about something, uh, you know, an upcoming trip. My centering word is the compassionate return to God. I, I get like in my in my centering prayer, it's yours. Why? You know, O-U-R-S, yours. So I will say yours and silently. And it helps return me to that place of, you know, I caught myself. You know, I caught myself. Um, it's like an anchor point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so uh, if it's helpful, um, you know, some suggested centering prayer, it's like you're lying on the bottom of a riverbed and you're watching uh, things float along the top of the river and you're you're observing it. You're not all of a sudden there's a boat and you're tempted to climb into the boat because the boat is. Uh, you know, proposal that's do at work, uh, a fight you had with a friend or your spouse or um, whatever it is, right? A college payment coming up that you're worried about. So you're tempted to climb into it. Instead, the sacred words allows me to let it, to note it, to uh, to to not not that I you know deny that it existed, but that I right. I, I note that uh, it was present. And then again, compassionate return. I can't stress that enough that if you know, as much as the practice is about returning, it's about developing self-compassion. So for me, during the five minutes right before this uh, podcast, when we did five minutes of centering, um, my mind went, Brad, I was jealous when you said two times in five minutes. For me, it was about 50. Yeah. And I kept going to our meeting tonight at five o'clock. And do I have the right handouts? And will I need to, you know, prepare a different document? And I got in that boat and the boat started to kind of paddle away. And then for me, the word recently is Abba. And so I caught myself. I became aware and attentive of the boat with these thoughts that had a lot of energy in them, frankly. And I just saw the boat and oh, Abba, and I could just send, settle back in. And I love what Thomas Keating says. You're speaking about this compassion. Keating says that when you notice or become aware that you are distracted, that you, quote, gently return to that sacred word. And the sacred word is not meant to be symbolic or meaningful or have any kind of special gravity in and of itself. It's just a word that feels right for you that is a representation of what you're trying to experience in that moment. So some people have had Jesus, Father, Lord, Spirit, Holy, uh, Light, Peace, etc. It's interesting you brought up yeah, uh, Abba. I, um, I met with this woman who's uh, she's into yoga. Um, she has been walking with God, listening to God, living with God for 10 years, but she's not so sure about the Jesus story yet and wondered why I'm so insistent on that. And I, I said, well, I believe you hear God well because of what Christ has done for you. And one of the great things he's done is revealed God as Abba as opposed to these other toxic images, right? So I I suggested that the next time she do yoga, she she use Abba as her as her mantra. Word. Wow! And uh, and so she did. And what she reported was, you know, all these years I have felt him right beside me, but when I said Abba, I felt him inside me, and I felt my rib cage open up, my heart open up, and I had total access and I'm like wow you should do that more often and she goes uh <laughs> duh like every day and so it's interesting that even you know here's a yogini practicing abba as her centering word and and had this intense experience of of really god in her right and um so so somehow um the the that word can become loaded in I like I like this I yours so mm. all of the things all of the things that we encounter in our minds along the way you like that's a releasement again right I, oh that's yours and that's yours and that's yours and then then it's that's actually effective intercession if you think about it but yes without the yes. grunting and groaning and tearing your sheets and swearing <laughs> you know or sweating or so or calluses on your knees mm. yeah. you know um 
I'm glad, Brad, you pointed out about how certain words can be loaded. Um, you know, so many people have had a toxic or abusive uh, experience with their dad, with their father, with their grandfather, with a father figure. And uh, so Abba is just one of many words. But, but when I say the word Abba, uh, two things are important to know. Number one, I always break into a smile when I say it. And for years, and I mean years, I could not say the word Abba. I could not say the word Papa that our friend Paul Young has popularized through the book The Shack. I would say the word Papa, and I would literally feel shame inside my body. Mm-hmm. And I would I would say the word Abba, and it was a little bit less. And, and now I can say the word uh, Papa, even Daddy sometimes, in reference to uh, the Heavenly Father, and there is just a joy that's there. So there's times when I think that word, although it, it's not important in a theological sense, it's important for our experience, for people to say, what fits me? Um, recently, I, I stole a phrase from Dallas Willard in his prayer life, uh, and, and he would simply sit quietly at times and say the words, right here right here. And I love that because it was that God is right here, uh, but also I'm right here. And there's that sense of I can be with myself, and in being with myself and present to myself, I'm I'm actually able to experience God's presence. But if I'm not present to myself, how could I expect to be engaged with God's presence? Mm. So the sacred word, Mm -hmm. you set the timer on your phone, Mm -hmm. and then what? Uh, And then we say it. And then it's, it is a, um, the majority of the time for me, and, and this isn't everyone's experience is, uh, it is a process of, you know, attaching to a thought and, uh, sometimes, you know, just fully gaze until I catch myself until that point where you realize, ah, and I use my sacred word, yours. Now I return and I have some quiet. And so, and uh, sometimes toward the end of the 20 minutes, um, there's a sense in which I'm in a place uh, that feels where, where I'm, I'm not aware of any specific thinking. A- at some point, my alarm goes off and the ripples come out. Uh, I turn the alarm off. I'll take maybe 30 seconds and just try and, you know, I, I, I loved an expression Jim Finley would use, and that is, can you carry a thread of your sit with you f- for the rest of the day? And so I, sometimes I'll think about where am I going from here? So where, what, what do I, what am I going to walk into? And how can I take something of this time? You know, how can I bring something of silence and solitude into some very chaotic, demanding um, encounters that I'll have? for that day. And just something about that feels, feels like a prayer feels like preparation. Uh, but that's it. It's not, it's not difficult. Sometimes I, and I'll do this. Like, you know, I have friends who will, they get up and they have a prayer bench and, and they hit it, you know, they're like before they shower every day. And then sometimes I'll do another 20 at night. I only can do 20 minutes a day. Uh, and, and I'm not faithful to praying every day. There's days when I miss, but like if I'm home in New Jersey in the little town I live in, there's a beautiful Creek with a, with a little, um, uh, car pull off and I'll, I'll go there even in the winter and I'll open up the, I'll open up the moonroof and the windows and put them down and I'll, and I'll turn the car off and do it right there. Um, so, you know, you can really, you can be creative. I've done it before in a, in a, in a customer's conference room in the Bronx. Um, oh, let's tell the story about St. Patrick's Cathedral uh, before we wrap up. Let's end on that. Yeah. So, so, uh, you, you, uh, uh, have come out to New York City a couple times, and uh, we've uh, walked around the city together. And we went to St. Patrick's one day, and you suggested uh, that we do a sit together, and and uh, it was just a very special time. And the, and the cathedral was under renovation; <laughs> it was had all this scaffolding and guys with you know belt sanders, jackhammers, belt jack, sanders. It was, it was unbelievable. Hammers, and it became this metaphor for um, you know uh, both both the rebuilding and the renewal of a church, but also of a community and of its people. And and, and it was a metaphor for me of my life and the calling mm. that uh, in the middle of New York City, perhaps the busiest city in the world, the most congested city in the world, maybe outside of Tokyo, um, that inside this 
cathedral crowded with tourists with cameras around their neck, flashing iPhones, with construction going on in the back, that we could sit Mm. and find stillness and unite with God who was already there with us. Um, And so if... I can do it there. I can do it anywhere, as Frank Sinatra <laughs> said about New York. Um, so, Brad, any final thoughts about Centering Prayer? And then I, I want to wrap up with a quote and two big ideas. Just, uh, you know, in the West, we have two words, meditation and contemplation. Um, and so David talks about meditation a lot in the Psalms. And I think of that. I'm coming from the Spanish mystics on this, that meditation is the prayer practices I bring to the table. And and then at some point, uh, I'll call it the, like the magical moment point, uh, The there's a reversal, and meditation becomes contemplation. Action becomes... Re, um, I, I cease activity, and and then I become aware of God's activity. And so it's like the flow reverses. So meditation is I begin this flow of of whatever my prayer practice is, and then when it flips into uh, the tide turns, and now it's God flowing into me, and they would call that contemplation. I think in maybe in the Far East they they reverse the terminology, but it's the same idea. So I love this idea of we we sit down and we hit the timer and we have a prayer word now and i'm i kind of am doing something but let it, the doing gets undone and now god is doing something grace is not opposed to the effort it's opposed to the earning mm. um and merton spoke of that idea in terms of a spring and a stream and that we're always going back and forth between the spring and the stream the source and the flow and the idea that we're we're really meant to live our life of faith and in union with God, like Psalm 23, where we go through a process and a practice on a daily basis where we're beside quiet waters and green pastures, walking through valleys, and then something happens internally where we begin to overflow. And that's, that, that's when life actually feels spiritual and not just volitional. Um, one big thought, one of my favorite quotes from Martin Laird, and I mentioned his book, Into the Silent Land, um, is... Uh, a quote where he says that in regard to contemplation, but specifically in regard to union with God, that most of us are like a person fishing for minnows while standing on the back of a whale. That there's something profound and real and and foundational to our lives that is the Trinitarian God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that is present in us and um, that we have full access to that within at any point in time. Um, Our listeners will probably be familiar with the book Practicing the Presence of God by... Brother Lawrence. Of the Resurrection. By Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. I almost said Brother Andrew. Um, And and, uh, I won't go into detail, but he was a, a monk who was a dishwasher because he didn't feel like he could pray very well and um, basically developed this whole idea of that prayer is just being present to presence. And so if you want to learn how to practice God's presence, one of the best ways to do that is simply by beginning to learn and experiment and practice Centering Prayer. For more information about Centering Prayer, there is a website uh, that is the organization founded by Thomas Keating, and it's Contemplative Outreach. Dot org contemplativeoutreach.org and then you could also buy a copy of my book Surfing for God Discovering the Divine Desire Beneath Sexual Struggle and it might be a curious chapter within that book but I asserted there that one of the best things that a person can do uh, for an addiction and specifically pornography fantasy addictions is to do centering prayer because instead of gazing at a digital image or images of pixels that you can begin to learn how to gaze inwardly and to be gazed upon. And so there's a chapter in Surfing for God called Less is More. It's a chapter about stillness, contemplation, and there's actually very detailed instructions there uh, and guidelines for doing centering prayer. So guys, we're wrapping up this episode. Peter, you and I are coming back for a second and third. Brad, you are going to go take a nap. And um, thanks for this conversation. Pleasure. Pleasure. So thank you for listening to another episode of Restoring the Soul. We want you to know that Restoring the Soul is so much more than a podcast. What we're all about is helping couples and individuals get unstuck. 
You know how some people go to counseling or marriage therapy for months or even years and never really get anywhere? Our intensive programs help clients get unstuck in as little as two weeks. To learn more, visit RestoringTheSoul.com. That's RestoringTheSoul.com. Thank you.